Hello everyone, hello everyone. Uh, today is an extremely special uh, day for me. Uh, you know, I will be talking in, in the next minutes with uh, one of the uh, one person that probably I admire most on my professional life. Uh, Jan knows how much uh, he influenced my life in the past years. Uh, so he was the former executive director of the United Nations Office for Project Services. And he was the one responsible for bringing me to one of the most rewarding and fantastic experience of my whole life. Uh, also, uh, Jan was a true uh, inspiration for me. I know he is not a big fan of Spotlight. So when I reached out to him, asking him to join me, uh, I, I was not expecting he would accept when I explained the what matters and the idea of talking about career. But I want to share with everybody that is watching this live and will watch this video some of uh, his experience. OK, so uh, Jan, uh, first of all, thank you very much. OK, thank you. I really, really I feel honored to have the chance uh, to be with you. Uh, here uh, doing this live and uh, you have an extraordinary career in the development and international development. So I want to kick off this uh, asking you, how was uh, the first steps of your professional life? How, how did the UN and everything else happen to you uh, in your life? Thank you. Um, so I didn't um, so I give up with my applications. And when I was just over 30, I landed a one-year contract for UNIDO in Sri Lanka. It was a junior entry-level job. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. And I noticed in this job that the sky was a limit in terms of what you could do. And um, as the saying goes, uh, the rest is history. I did have some very interesting other job opportunities and I could have gone into that, but I won't. Um, there was never any hesitation. I wanted to stay in this job. And of course, there were some hard times, even some risks, but I could never see myself doing anything else. Can you actually hear me now? Because for a moment, I don't hear anything. It's I Good. muted my Good. mic. I muted my mic. And now your echo comes to an end. So I'm doing that now. Don't worry. Go ahead. Glorious. Glorious. Thank you. So um, I don't know if you muted the sound as well. I, I did my best to try to answer your first question, how I ended up in the UN. Yeah. Uh, one key thing, Jan, about, about your work at the UN, and I mentioned this very clearly in my episode two when we, I was talking about options, and I said about mobility. So you live it in so many places, and and how how this first? Uh, I can see the Buddha on your back uh, 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 behind you, and all the experiences. So I would love to hear from you how this sense of mobility uh, create an impact. On, on on who you are and your career and your career as a diplomat and a civil international civil servant yeah listen um, that's a good question and I just want to say that there are certain challenges for most people and their families when they move around like I've been doing and I do respect those who feel that this is not for them. But for me, it's been such a privilege to live in several countries and traveling for work to many, many more, everywhere in the world, really. Um, frankly, it's only now with COVID that I don't travel constantly. And it does feel rather strange. So for me, uh, travel has always given me energy and opportunities to, to learn. Um, it's, it's fantastic. It's my life. I become a sort of international gypsy. That's, that's, you know, I, I happen to be from a country, but I really feel like uh, a citizen of the world. Now, you asked, I think you said something about career-wise as well. Well, listen, 
depending on the organization, typically every move also means a promotion, right? More responsibilities and so on. And I know that most organizations appreciate stuff that are mobile, ready to go, even at a short notice, uh, wherever they are most needed. So that's kind of the mobility story a little bit in answer to your question. Wonderful. I, I have one. Uh, look, I have some questions here, but I also want to give the opportunity uh, to other people to ask. So I have one question I'm just putting on the on the screen now. Uh, so I'm interested to become the executive director of UNOPS. What is your advice to get into that position? So I don't know if you have an answer, but if you can answer to to the Yama's question. <laughs> That's good. Man. I wish I didn't have to answer so specifically on the executive director in, in, in UNOPS because Frankly, that was never my specific career objective. My objective was to work in development. Um, and, you know, somehow one thing leads to the next. So I guess then my question is that be interested in working in development, get field experience, um, show results, uh, and then apply for whatever job you want to apply for. If you're looking for an executive director position in particular, I guess it is also very important that you on along the road here that you get some management experience in, in UNOPS, you know, there are thousands of people working and, and, and lots of issues with, with managing large group of people in a far flying organization. So management experience is also very important. But the starting point is really your passion, uh, your field level, hands-on experience on the ground in, in implementing projects. Uh, I think that's a, a very good beginning for a career towards uh, UNOPS uh, executive director position. Thanks. Uh, Jan, uh, one thing we were discussing um, when we first spoke, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, facing challenges, facing problems and and one of the remarkable things of of my five years at the UN is that uh, you know you you see a lot of I would say personal tragedies you know people suffering from war from hunger and this and at the same time this makes you more sad but at the same time more happy uh, on on being able to to help them and to support them my question to you is uh, how do you handle uh failure challenges you know because it's it's very easy for example when we all of us see you here with an absolutely wonderful career but we know that there are so there were so many roadblocks in the middle of that so how do you cope with the different challenges you faced in your life to make you more strong yeah, there, there were probably many things about uh, in, in your question there that are very important. And uh, I'm glad to hear that you're referring back to discussions that we had, have had before, Ricardo. If you talk specifically about how to handle successes and failures, I think it's important that you somehow get comfortable with being a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Um, it's nothing wrong in being in your comfort zone. That's how most of the good work is done in teams, you know, when, when they have the right tools and, and they know what they're doing and they're confident that they can show results. But stretching things a little bit further and working with the unknown, um, you have to go beyond that and you have to be prepared to take some risks, right? And that means that you also need to accept failure. And there are different types of failures, of course. Um, I, I tend to, well, they only affect myself, you know, what I think about myself. I should have done better. I should have been better prepared. I should have gone left when I went right. And it only impacted yourself or your own ego. Well, listen, as long as you learn something from it, right? Uh, have a big learning budget, a big learning account, and, and move on. 
and, and I have a very big one. Of course, if there are failures which affect others, you have to recognize that, you have to apologize, you have to correct the failures to the extent that's possible. Uh, so I guess my, my comment here, Ricardo, is that risks and potential failures is part of life. If you take no risks, then it's very limited what you can achieve. If you're prepared to take some risks, accept some failures, uh, you probably get more done uh, in terms of innovation, creativity. We talked earlier about the two of us happening to be engineers, but of course there are lots of people are problem solvers. Uh, sometimes, you know, problem is right there. You don't have a choice. You have to find a solution and maybe you don't, uh, but you go on, you go on. That that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Fias, from our colleague uh, Fias from Unops. Is how do you compare the work? Because of course you you are uh, an international development champion, uh, comparing UN organizations and the private sector. So what what do you see in commonalities and differences? What what is in your mind on that? Uh, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that. Great, great question. question. And now I have to ask uh, Ricardo to, to, to turn off his microphone. In which case, maybe I'm slightly more coherent. Um, well, listen, I think you are privileged to work in the um, public sector, uh, international public sector, like the UN, UNOPS, or the World Bank in terms of the work you're doing, the results that you're working with teams to, to achieve. Um, and you can do a lot. If you have an opportunity to work in the private sector, you can also do a lot. So it's not one or the other. Uh, I'm sure there are differences uh, in, in many ways in the culture of organizations and so on. But since we're talking here about development, sustainable development, or making a difference in the world, in terms of people's uh, lives. Let's be mindful of the fact that there is quite a strong movement in industry as well these days, in private sector. Uh, of course, to continue to, to make a profit, nothing wrong with that, but also to show social and environmental sustainability. As a matter of fact, uh, this is an area that I've been working on quite a bit uh, since I left UNOPS and, and I'm impressed with a lot of, shall we say, more progressive companies that uh, join the UN Global Compact, sign up for the 10 principles, um, who um, try to do the right thing in terms of their social and environmental responsibility and private sector can do a lot. And they do that because of how consumers look at them, but also um, because of how they can attract young people in particular. Uh, they know that a lot of young people uh, will look very hard at their performance, not just, you know, how things look at their website, um, if they talk the talk, but if they walk the walk in terms of the responsibility for, let's say, CO2 emissions or, or, or human rights. So, um, I'm not saying that one thing is better than the other, uh, and I'm not saying that they are not different in terms of cultures, but you can actually uh, work for good organizations, both in the public sector and in the private sector, organizations that do good for the world. Yeah, I, I have one, one question. I remember when I was at the beginning of my journey at UNOPS uh, in 2012 and 2013, and it was the time that uh, UNOPS was starting his new strategic plan and this, and the central piece was uh, sustainability. And this, uh, I, I'm very thankful because my PhD was made because of the inspiration you provided at that time uh, at UNOPS. Uh, and, how sustainability came to you as such a relevant uh, topic and point to talk about to be the central piece of a very relevant UN entity? 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, Ricardo, it's so intrinsic to um, human well-being. And when I talk a little bit about just, you know, fairness and social justice and for everybody getting an opportunity and for development to really work, sustainability is is the central aspect of this, even if we didn't use the term sustainability in, in those days. Now, of course, we got to learn more in the quote unquote industry uh, about how everything is connected as well, uh, people's lives and, and their environment. So this became, I think, very, just very central also to work, our work in, in, in UNOPS. And I'm glad that because we were quite an agile organization with lots of good people that together as a team, we were really able to to again not just talk the talk but actually walk the walk and, and get the job done uh, in a more sustainable way in, in our projects around the world and and that you were uh, also uh, very much a leader of this a lot of this and again i'm back to talking about not only the un but also the private sector is a journey it's a journey that you want to move through fast. Uh, in a sense, it's a marathon, but there are also sprints. You know, you, you have to be patient. You have to show some results and, and, and get going on this journey. And, and you see that in, in different organizations. And we as, as managers and as staff, whether we work in the UN or, or in the private sector, we can all contribute to that kind of journey of sustainability. And in our daily lives as well, of course. Yeah, Ian, um, I, I cannot agree more. But one thing that I'm sure that everybody that is listening to, to you speaking is that uh, you are always extremely humble on, on your comments and, and on everything. I never saw you say anything as like, uh, I did this, I did that. No, no, it's always, we did it, we did that. And, and this is absolutely incredible. But I have one question uh, for you that Basha asked it. Uh, uh, it's about, uh, you have a remarkable uh, history at UNOPS. You did one of the, I would say, the most relevant turnarounds of a, a UN entity because when you join it, uh, UNOPS was in serious uh, challenges and, and you turn it into something really uh, uh, relevant. So tell me what were the skills you, you, you put that and, and how you manage this? Uh, because I heard this history from you, so I know what you maybe, but many people do not know how challenging it was when you just joined it, uh, uh, UNOPS. So if you can share with us. <laughs> All right. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a long journey. Um, so, um, but listen, a good question again. I, I just a, a little joke to start with. UNOPS was in big trouble. And when you take on a big trouble, you know, the expectations are, are low. and, and of course, you can fail, but then you're excused. And if you succeed, uh, well, it can only get better, right? So there's something that speaks for a low starting point. And unfortunately, that's what we had back then in terms of the finances of the organization. Of course, there were good people and there was something good to build upon. And I think that's always very important as a manager to, to, to uh, take account of. So identify what is good, build on that, identify what is bad and do something about it, right? Um, the journey, the success was about hiring, well, about supporting the good people that were still in the organization, about hiring new people who, who brought in something new. Um, I'm a great believer in diversity of having people with different backgrounds from different parts of the world, gender, you know, any diversity you can think about. I think it's very, very important in an organization that is vibrant, innovative, creative, that you don't just speak to yourself all the time. You speak to different people. You, you get inputs from different people. 
So bring in good people in terms of um, their personalities and mindset, the culture, and what they bring to the table. <laughs> and of course, uh, um, you started by saying that I hired you. So that, that was one such example, right? Um, totally unexpected hire for, for, for UNOPS, which helped us uh, get where we were. Another very important aspect, I think, in terms of um, making an organization successful is back to putting challenges for yourself. We talked earlier about the comfort zone and so on. I think you need to set very ambitious uh, targets, stretch targets, a bit higher than what is reasonable and, and try to get there. And also to benchmark yourself with the best. And in UNOPS, we did benchmark ourselves with the rest of the UN system and the best of development organizations, but we also benchmarked ourselves with the private sector in terms of various standards, whether product management standards or, or environmental standards. So, so that benchmarking, I think, is very important as well. Uh, maybe I could also have written a PhD thesis. And I, I was, by the way, very glad just after I left UNOPS, I was um, invited to give a three hour lecture at INSEAD in, in Paris um, about my experience in UNOPS because that allowed me to reflect a little bit about those eight years. So I guess what I gave you now is a short version of, of that three hour lecture. Maybe uh, wonderful. Some, uh, maybe missing some important points. <laughs> Uh, I want just to ask uh, uh, João Carlos Pellicer, Pellicer, my dear friend, he said that he liked a lot your comments on risk management and he would love to see how you think about the balance between innovation versus risks that could kill the business. Okay. Um, okay. I'm glad you used the word uh, risk I'm glad management. You used the word risk management. And as you know, and, and as you know, we all know, uh, we all know off the please turn off the recorder. microphone, Ricardo. <laughs> is that some people confuse risk management with uh, risk being risk averse. And so you have to identify the risks, of course. Um, and you have to learn with risks that pop up suddenly that you have not identified in advance. But be clear about the risk environment. And, and how to deal with it. So, so that's really a starting point. If you don't do that, and I guess that was part of what I said earlier, uh, you probably will not get much innovation. You probably will not be able to solve the real issues. In an organization, I think it's very important also that you don't punish people for failures as, as long as how should I put it? Um, as, as long as, you know, the team, the person took a calculated risk, did the best you could to manage it. And yes, you failed. Uh, that should not be a showstopper in terms of career. Uh, if you learn something from it, it should be an encouragement, actually. So, so that would be my, my short answer. Don't avoid risks. Manage them. Uh, frankly, even encourage people to, to, to deal with them uh, or you'll get nowhere as an organization and, and also as a person. Um, people may think yeah, that's the best that career, that career by staying away from risks, by being risk averse, but I actually think in most cases, the strongest careers, since we're talking about careers, uh, you have from people that are uh prepared to take some risks because that's how you get the results and that's in the end what you get re rewarded for yeah oh, jan what you just said it's something that i'm i'm thinking a, a lot recently about the concept of psychological safety you know that companies need to provide some kind of psychological safety so people can really experiment without being uh, surrounded by fear or from all sides on what uh, will I be punished and this. And also what you just said to me, it's at the central piece of what I tell everybody is that sometimes you really need to, to push the boundaries, you know, to push the boundaries to try something. And I, I can tell you, uh, 
when when I arrived in June 2012 at UNOPS, I said, look what I'm doing here. You know, it's so different. And 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 this was uh, allowing me to have this different experience in life. And, and this is very uh, important. But th thanks for that. I, I have a, a one question from my friend Ali Sheikh. Uh, he used to work, we, we, we used to work together at UNOPS. Uh, uh, he was part of the project management team. And, and he said, uh, he did a more specific, but I will explain his question, but I want to take to a broader audience. He said uh, about some competition among UN sister agencies, uh, you know, trying to, to get things uh, done. And, and he said that this is uh, blocking some of the value perceived around the UN work. He would love to hear you from that. And uh, the, for me, the main important question to you is, are you optimistic about the future? How do you see the future uh, of, of work and the future of UN? How, how optimistic you are on that? Could I ask you a question first? How much time do we have? Actually, I meant in a half an hour when we did our technical stuff to... Yeah, stuff to yeah I will, I will ask time you time this question and I have one more if someone uh, okay. show up. I have okay. this quick question and another one and then, and okay. then we are done. All right, super. And we have some time management as well. Um, great question. I, or questions, there were two that I observed. The first one about competition uh, among UN agencies. It seems to be something very human, this competitive nature that you have, you know, the turf issue between teams within an organization or between organizations. And that is something that I've always had great difficulty in, in accepting. And you may remember, uh, I'm sure you remember, Ricardo, in UNOPS, for example, our managers had two responsibilities. One is to manage their organization and their own deliverables. The other one was to take responsibility for the whole organization and help other units as well. And that's how managers' performance were assessed, not narrowly, suboptimally on, on a unit. And that's how I have always tried to look at the UN system and the UN and all its partners as well. Of course, it's easy to say that and this a bit tougher in reality because of this, you know, herd or flock or whatever mentality that, that people have of wanting their own team to win, maybe at the expense of, of, of the goal that you all should be focused on. So, so I guess that's my main point here. Yes, be a good team member. But look at why you're there. Look at the bigger objective that you try to achieve. And that objective, you normally don't achieve well by competing with everybody else, but you achieve better by partnering with others and to make everybody realize that there are win-win situations most of the time, certainly in development, as opposed to competing interests, let's say within a UN organization or between UN organizations and more broadly. Now, on the issue of optimism, you know what? I have been so disappointed with certain things happening in the world over the last four or five years that I had not expected. Uh, it, it felt like a big setback in terms of global ambitions in many areas, such as climate change. I am still inside a born optimist. I was thinking all along that the pendulum will swing and yes, there's a setback and it will come back even stronger. But of course, somehow the center of gravity where this pen pendulum hangs, I think has moved as well. And there are problems right now, I think in the world community in terms of how people look at global problems that the world has to solve through collaboration. It's actually, the two questions are great, I'll link to each other. It's back to the issue in the sense of turf versus working together for broader goals. Um, I'm still optimistic. I'm more optimistic than before. 
um, with the recent election in uh, what is still the most powerful country in the world uh, and the focus let's say on on climate um, i'm very hopeful for cop 26 in in glasgow in terms of the world community getting together again maybe it was a good thing that it was postponed for a year uh, i'm hopeful that this terrible experience of COVID-19 that we're still in the midst of, even if we see the light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully, uh, will uh, lead to a deeper understanding over time of how interconnected we are and how we have to work together to solve our common problems, whether it's health and pandemics, whether it's global warming and climate change, uh, whether it's issues of, 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 of basic poverty in, in parts of the world, uh, in short, sustainable development. I, I actually am right now, thanks for asking the question, I'm right now more optimistic than I've been over the last five years, having always been optimistic. Always been optimistic. Thank you. It's it's really inspiring to hear you because yeah, it, it's a very powerful statement. There are so many people saying thank you for the insights. But I have a final question to you, and I'm asking this. Uh, uh, Ten days ago, I interviewed one Brazilian entrepreneur uh, that did extremely well uh, in in the tech sector, and I want to ask you if you, Jan, were able to talk to your 20 year old self what would you say to the young Yamatsan? you know i heard this question um, in your previous episode i think and i thought that is such a great question <laughs> ricardo and so i've given a lot of thought to it i'm not sure if I'm such a good answer but part of the advice that i would have given myself I probably would have, would have followed in a sense uh, without giving it a lot of thought or even use the words that I'm using right now. And that is essentially to, to, to follow your passion and your values, values and to figure out what matters most to you. Um, it's about not putting all your eggs in one basket. Don't be so focused that you miss opportunities. Try to stay broad. Try to make sure you don't miss the forest for the tree for the trees. And we discussed it earlier. Don't avoid risks. Don't be too afraid of making mistakes. Give yourself that big learning budget, the learning account, where you can put those expenses, uh, even if they can be a bit annoying or or even embarrassing. Um, if I were to give myself some advice that I have not necessarily followed. <laughs> Uh, maybe it would have been, don't work so hard. I'm not complaining that I work all the time because, you know, work and life for me is just so intertwined. And that's, that's the right thing for me, but there's more things in life than work. So keep that in mind as well. And especially, uh, I'd say, take more time out for the arts, music in particular, uh, not just listening which 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 i enjoy but but even you know creating performing when, when i look at friends who um, are you know good singers or they play instruments like actually my wife and, and my daughter i'm so happy for them and i wish i could have done that myself and maybe it's not too late ricardo maybe i actually should start <laughs> playing an instrument i don't know about my singing i, I think that that won't win any approval but 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 um that's uh, that's the advice i would give you know be broad and and focus on the things you want to achieve professionally but but focus on your other interests as well yeah that's that's the end of our talk but i want really first I want to thank on behalf of everybody uh, here for you to given the time to share with you. I think that uh, you are one of the most brilliant minds I have ever met. And in your style, you know, your piece, how many times I arrived in your office, what we need to do? And then you say, Come, relax, do you want the coffee? Let's take a cup. And I will never forget that. And I, you know, and, and for those who are watching, uh, 
uh, Jan has an absolutely special place where uh, uh, to justify where I am today. And I will never forget that, okay? Thank you very much, Jan, for your time and your willingness to talk to me on that. And thank you all for participating, okay? And see you next time. This video will be available on YouTube. So if you want to watch again, Jan, thank you one more time, okay? Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you everyone. Thank you. And uh, best wishes to everyone for the year and festivities and for the next year and for your careers, everyone. Bye bye.